Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Full work limited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Welcome to the Eric Erickson Show podcast, hour two. Hello, America. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here across the United States of America. The phone number is 877-973-7425. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm ordering my turkey and ham. <laughs> you caught me. Okay. I, I got to talk about the raw politics now, um, if if you'll allow, uh, some of which uh, we talked about earlier, and I just need to fill you in on everything that's happening. The Republican debate is going to be tomorrow night. Doug Burgum, who? I, I don't know. Apparently the governor of North Dakota, I, I guess he was the guy ranting about drill, drill, drill on stage. He's not going to be on stage. He didn't make the cutoff. He was essentially bribing voters. Uh, you give him a dollar, he's going to give you a $20 gift card. He had to have so many donors, small dollar donors, to get on the stage. But he also had to improve his polling, and he hadn't improved his polling any. So he won't be on stage Asa Hutchinson won't be on stage. They don't matter anyway. Uh, it'll be Tim Scott, Chris Christie, Vivek Ramaswamy, Nikki Haley, and Ron DeSantis will be on stage tomorrow night. Uh, it'll be in Miami. Uh, NBC, I think, is is doing the debate. I don't know why they gave NBC a debate, given how ruthlessly anti-Republican is. I mean, it, I mean, if you're going to do a media outlet that's not Fox or Newsmax, CNN. Uh, is giving the Republicans a, a more fair shake. And I know it's CNN, but still, they're giving Republicans a more fair shake than NBC and MSNBC. It's it's truly bizarre the that they would give something to NBC, particularly its online stuff has just been so ruthlessly anti-Republican. But they uh, did. Uh, so the Republican National Committee helping NBC trash Republicans on stage in Miami. And I'm sure Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley are going to go after each other. They kind of have to. Kim Reynolds has endorsed Ron DeSantis in Iowa. She, I mentioned this yesterday. She's got a big, uh, a big, big fundraising machine in Iowa. And she is going to pull out all the stops to help Ron DeSantis. Now, this matters in Iowa because of the way the caucuses work. The caucuses do not rely on total number of votes cast. Uh, what happens in the caucuses is you go in and everybody picks their first choice and you stay a very long time. A caucus is not a go in, cast a vote and leave. It's a I go and I commit to go and I commit to stay and it's snowing outside. You gotta be really committed. This is why, for example, a lot of people look at Nikki Haley surging in Iowa and they say it doesn't really matter because she's surging with independents, not dyed in the wool Republicans. And are those independents who like her, are they really going to go register as a Republican on the day of the caucus and hang out for four or five hours with no child care while it's snowing to support Nikki Haley? Probably not. The way it works is you go and you go to a gym, you go to a you go to a, a high school gym somewhere, and it's the middle of winter in Iowa. It's dark, it's cold, there's snow on the ground, and everybody makes a pitch. I'm here to support Donald Trump. I support Donald Trump because he's making America great again, because Donald Trump was a great president. He did blah, 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 blah. I'm here to support Ron DeSantis because Ron DeSantis is going to make America great again, greater than Donald Trump made it, and he's the governor of Florida, and he's done blah, 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 blah. I'm here for Nikki Haley because she's the grown-up among the kids and we need an adult in the room and blah, 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 blah. I'm here for Tim Scott because Tim Scott's a great American from South Carolina, Senate of Slaves. He can give the Republicans their first black president and he can make America great again too, blah, 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 blah. And everybody makes their pitch and then you go vote for who you want to vote for. And then the people who are at the bottom and they don't win, they say, okay, this guy's out. He didn't get enough here. Let's vote again. And you vote. 
and you vote and you vote and you vote, and then eventually someone gets a majority of the vote in that particular precinct, and they've won the precinct. Takes a long time, and it's the second choice that matters because your first choice typically isn't going to win. So if Vivek Ramaswamy or Nikki Haley or Tim Scott or Mike Pence or Doug Burgum or Asa Hutchinson or whoever is your first choice and Ron DeSantis is your second choice, you add them all together and that gives Ron DeSantis an advantage over Donald Trump because even Donald Trump's voters, their second choice is mostly Ron DeSantis. And all the other candidates, their second choice is mostly Ron DeSantis. So Ron DeSantis gets an advantage in Iowa because it's the second choice that tends to win, and he's the second choice. So if he wins Iowa, suddenly Donald Trump does not look inevitable, and DeSantis can bounce around, on paper at least. In reality, Donald Trump's voters are very committed to Donald Trump, and Donald Trump is less than 50% in Iowa, but over 50% pretty much everywhere else. And unless you're from Rio Linda, you understand that 50 plus one is a majority. And it's winner take all in New Hampshire and South Carolina. The Democrats, however, have a problem. And that is Joe Biden. Americans don't like him. I mentioned this yesterday. All the people who will be voting in 2024 were alive and remembered 20. 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. They may have been young if they're an 18-year-old voter, but they remembered it. There was no war in Israel. There was no war in Ukraine. There was no hyperinflation. There was no recession. There was no massive cost of living increase. There was no massive surge in gas prices. You worried Donald Trump might start World War III on Twitter, but he never did. And now here's looks like World War III and Joe Biden's in charge. People remember that stuff. And then they remember his age. Here's Frank Luntz. He was on CNN talking about this. Frank, what's what's the alternative? Uh, It could be Gavin Newsom, the governor of California. It could be Cory Booker, the senator from nearby in New Jersey. It could be uh, Gretchen Whitmer, the governor of Michigan. And and my favorite, um, Mitch Lander. No, this is the former mayor of uh, New Orleans. All these people are are great candidates. Mm -hmm. Great leaders. Cory Booker has done this before. He has the skills. But in the end, the Republicans at this moment have been tearing themselves apart in the House. And it's interesting that the Democrats are now doing this in the White House. But make no mistake, you can reverse inflation. You can stop a war. But you can't reverse age. Mm -hmm. And it's not about voting for Joe Biden when he's 81 years old. Is about voting for Joe Biden when he's 86, because that's how old he would be when this is all done. In the end, the American people, particularly younger voters, are saying, you know what? Thank you, Mr. President. You've done a good job, but it's time for somebody younger. Time for somebody younger. You notice what the Democratic strategy is now. If you've noticed the media coverage of Donald Trump in the last week, there's a market uptick in he's making mistakes. He, he seems out of his mind. He seems confused. He... He misstated when he was president and things like that. They're trying because the polling shows voters don't believe that Trump's age is as a negative against him as they do Biden. And so the Democrats are playing catch up on Trump's flubs to try to make him sound very old. This is a deliberate tactic by the Democrats. And notice what they're not doing. They're not shoving Joe Biden aside. They're just trying to make people realize that Donald Trump's going to be old, too. It should, If it matters for Biden, it should matter for Trump, but it doesn't because he's not as visible as Biden. Listen to uh, Wolf Blitzer asked David Axelrod. David Axelrod saw the New York Times Siena College polling, said this is bad. Democrats need to take this seriously. Joe Biden may need to step aside. And Blitzer asks Axelrod directly, do you want Biden to step aside? This is what Axelrod said in response. I want him to consider uh, what is best in terms of the goal that I know he is committed to, which is defeating Donald Trump. And if he uh, if he believes based on um, not just what's in his heart, but what's in uh, data and what he's being told that he has the best chance to do it, uh, then then he should he should run. Uh, There's there is reason to be concerned and people shouldn't dismiss uh, these polls. And should the president. Uh, press forward, I think that they need to really kick this another notch. Need to kick it another notch. 
They need to figure this out. And then there's Brad Moskowitz, a uh, Democratic congressman. He says something that the losers always say. Today, so we've now heard from a handful of Democrats, from David Axelrod uh, to Congresswoman uh, Jayapal uh, to obviously Dean Phillips, who's running against Biden in the primaries, all expressing concern about Biden's run in 2024, especially after the latest poll numbers. Um, do you share those concerns? I don't share those concerns. Now, look, I think we should look at the poll. we got to get into the data, and we can figure out how we need to improve our, our messaging. Because I do think we have a messaging issue in that we got to continue to feed the beast every single solitary day. I mean, one of the things we learned is that Donald Trump was on TV a lot. He got a lot of interviews in the, in the last election. And because of that, people just saw him and got his name ID out. Not that Joe Biden doesn't have good name ID. But Trump is on TV every single solitary day now. Three times a day, four times a day sometimes. We're seeing it played over and over. Joe Biden's got to get out there. we got to get our surrogates out there because we do have to message not just the young people. We have to explain what Donald Trump is going to do if he returns. I mean, there, I just read an article of the 18 things Donald Trump would do if, when he comes back. Some of them are just outrageous, like de starting to deport people, Muslim bans all over again. I mean, it's just absolutely lunacy. It's messaging. That's what the losers always say. It's just messaging. We've got a bad message. If your message is bad, you're losing. When you're saying you got to tweak your message, you acknowledge you're losing. Now, what is the message? Well, it probably doesn't help that it, the worst anti-Semitic violence since the Holocaust, Joe Biden's out lecturing America on Islamophobia. You've got a transgender killer in Nashville, Tennessee, gunning down children in an elementary school, and he's lecturing the country on violence against the trans community. Joe Biden labeled Bidenomics a great thing, and Bidenomics is what Americans hate right now. If it's the messaging, it's the messenger, because the messenger is not delivering a good message, because the messenger is out to lunch, feeble-minded, dementia-addled, and can't put two words together without falling over. It's a damning indictment on the state of play of the Democrats, frankly, that they're now trying to do this to Donald Trump and say, look, he's old too. He's enfeebled as well. That's not exactly a reassurance of your own candidate when you're trying to say, look, look, Donald Trump's old and enfeebled too. That just means both parties should find someone younger. And I don't know that they are. But what is remarkable, and it actually is remarkable to me, as much as people hate Donald Trump, and they do, I know many of you like him, but the average American hates Donald Trump. They would still prefer the man they hate than Joe Biden because they hate him more. This is becoming more and more the 2016 scenario where people hated Donald Trump then, but they hated Hillary Clinton more. You may like Donald Trump, but most Americans don't, but they still would prefer him to Joe Biden right now because they remember Donald Trump's presidency and they didn't like him then, but their lives didn't suck. And right now, given the man who's who I hate, but my life didn't suck versus the man I hate and my life does suck, you'll go with the one you hate where your life doesn't suck. And many of you will take that because your life didn't suck either when Donald Trump was president. None of our lives did. We didn't have rampant inflation. We didn't have high gas prices. We didn't have war in the Middle East. We didn't have war in Europe. We didn't have any of these things. And the question for Trump's primary opponents is, can they make a different case for themselves? Like, for example, I'll give you what Trump gave you, but you can get me for eight years, not four. I'll give you what Trump gave you, and we might be able to save the Senate, too. I'll give you what Trump gave you, and we won't be wiped out. I don't know. But they got to come up with a way to message it, and they can't. I am more and more convinced that all of these Republican opponents, Trump, from Haley to DeSantis on down, they're waiting for some external events for conviction or lightning bolt or act of God or something to take Trump out that they've just given up trying to take him out and instead are cruising for second place, hoping that something happens before the convention to make their case. Might be a smart strategy because every attack against Trump makes him stronger right now, it seems. The problem for Republicans, though, again, is you pour all these resources into getting him elected. You've only got him for four years when any of these other people could be there for eight. Guys, if you're a small, mid-sized business, you're struggling with HR issues, you have employees not showing up, or you got to do a termination, you need onboarding of employees, maybe there's a sexual harassment complaint. You want an HR manager. You don't want to be the bad guy with your employees. Bambi can play the role of HR for you. $99 a month, available by phone, email, real-time chat. They do onboardings, terminations, they help your team members get to peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations regardless of which state. They're great. 
Now, they're U.S.-based. They, you got somebody to talk to who's dedicated to your team. They give you access to HR expertise, and they add personal touches. So even though they're outsourced by your company, they really feel like they're a part of your team. That matters. Go to Bambi.com right now. Type in Eric Erickson under podcast. When you sign up, it'll help my show. Bambi.com, B-A-M-B-E-E.com, Bambi.com, Eric Erickson in the podcast tab. You know, with the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandsLots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. I, I, I got to just, because I, I know the number of people who have come up to me from in the conservative movement and says, oh, oh, Candace Owens. What do you think of Candace Owens? Isn't she so brilliant? And I always try to bite my tongue because I don't want to insult people. But no, she's a blithering idiot who just tells you what you want to hear. I mean, y'all, this is, this is, I got to play you this clip of this. I could watch this over and over and over again. This is an interview she, she did with a guy from Israel. Listen to this. My grandfather grew up in a segregated South. And so when I'm walking mm-hmm. through Jerusalem and you see, and they say, these are the Muslim quarters. This is where the Muslims are right. allowed to live. That doesn't mm-hmm. feel like a bastion of freedom to me. Um, so I, I guess. Oh, I, I don't think it's where they're allowed to live in Jerusalem. I think it's that there are, there's an Armenian quarter. It's not saying the Armenians can only live here. It's that there are communities just like there's a, a Jewish community in, in Jersey here. And there's a Muslim community in here. I don't think. Yeah, she, this idiot, went to Jerusalem and found the Muslim quarter and assumed that's where the Jews let the Muslims live. No, you idiot, it's called the Muslim quarter because historically that's where the Muslims lived. There's also a Jewish quarter and there's an Armenian quarter because that's where the, the, the people set themselves up. Oh my gosh, how stupid can a person be? She's an anti-Semite. She does not like the Jews. You'll notice that after the October 7th atrocity, Candace Owens said exactly Jack. She had to do her research. But then you got Queen Rania or whatever of of Jordan comes out and and blasts Israel, goes full anti-Semite on the occupation of Palestine. And she's like, I agree with this woman. I shouldn't be called anti-Semitic for agreeing with this anti-Semite. And the idiot doesn't even realize that the Muslim quarter is called the Muslim. It's not where Muslims are allowed to live or forced to live. It's it's because that's where Muslims historically lived in Jerusalem, and it became called the Muslim quarter. Good Lord, what an idiot this woman is. She's anti-Semitic. I cannot believe she has a platform at the Daily Wire still. But she's under contract there. I guess they're smart to leave her there so she didn't go somewhere else. But good Lord, stop praising Candace Owens, this girl is a grifter who is an idiot, who is an anti-Semite. I have no use for her, and neither should any of you. I mean, she blatant anti-Semitism. Just good gracious. I, I'm. It's easy now that I can do this, but, man, for so long people say, oh, but she's, we need a young black girl like her to persuade other black people. to No, no one in the black community is going to listen to Candace Owens and say, oh, I think I'll listen to this girl. She sounds smart. No, she doesn't. Stop citing Candace Owens. She's just a waste of space on the Internet. Now, I must move on to Americans for Prosperity that is not a waste of space, but an activist community that is committed to change for conservative greatness in this country. They are a do tank, not a think tank. They do the business of the conservative movement. They don't sit in Washington, D.C. and trade white papers. They actually get out into the states They're organized effectively in 36 states, and they're growing in the others, and their whole job is to fight for the conservative movement, and they lead an army of activists around the country fighting for the conservative movement, encouraging the conservative movement to take action and grow. They fight for free markets and free people, and they educate their activists to make the best, most persuasive arguments to your neighbors, to your friends, to your family, to your school board, to your city council, to your county commission, to your state government. You become more informed. You become more effective in the fight for freedom by joining Americans for Prosperity. Go to americansforprosperity.org slash Eric today. americansforprosperity.org slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K. 
You sign up with them. It's a very easy process. They start giving you the information you need to be persuasive. They train you as an activist. It's so good. Americansforprosperity.org slash Eric. Well, step into the world of power, loyalty, and luck. I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. With family, cannolis, and spins mean everything. Now, you want to get mixed up in the family business. Introducing The Godfather at ChompaCasino.com. Test your luck in the shadowy world of The Godfather slot. Someday, I will call upon you to do a service for me. Play The Godfather now at ChompaCasino.com. Welcome to the family. VGW Group, no purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. Welcome. It's Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877 877- 973 should you wish to be on the program. I am happy to have you on the program. I, so I've had this topic on, on the show notes for the last two days about the economic war between China and the United States. And at some point, I might get to it, but I need to, I, I need to go in a different direction right now. <laughs> it's my show. I, I'm allowed to do this. It is the Eric Erickson Show. Because I'm, I'm writing this stuff, so I'm, um, you know, normally what happens is during the show, we take one of the monologues, we send it out to subscribers, and, and Philip writes up a text for me. I sign off on it. He's done, gotten very good at put, taking the monologue and, and rewriting my words to for people to read. And today, I just like, I, I want to write this one myself. And now that I've written it, and you'll get the video, I, I got to, there, there's a tangent here. I've talked about this topic every once in a while before, but I really, I, I, let me spend a few moments with you on this because I, I think this is probably more important than the, the major headlines, the, the major economic stuff, and we'll get to all of that. But we've got a lot of new listeners since the last time I talked about this. I'm talking about postmodernism because what we're confronting is postmodernity. I struggled with the concept for a really long time. I didn't quite understand what was meant by the idea of postmodernism. It was actually uh, Tim Keller, the theologian who passed away this year. He had gotten to be a friend of mine, and he explained it to me. Because, like, So I took philosophy in college, and I hated the class. I didn't like it. My kids go to a classical Christian school right now, and they're required to take logic classes. I never had a logic class other than in law school you had to learn it, but the whole uh, the logical arguments and the fallacies and all that, and it just it, it goes along with the philosophies, and it just it it it's not that it goes over my head. It's like it never penetrates my head because it's so damn boring. Excuse my language. I just ugh. And, and then you start reading, and and here's something I've learned about academics along the way. So when I was in law school, I took a legal writing class, and I actually, so I've got a law degree, and I have a separate degree in legal writing. And our professor made a point one time. Her name was Linda Edwards. She's actually her husband's now, I think, the bishop for Nevada for the Episcopal Church. Uh, She's a wonderful, wonderful lady. Great, great. She taught property. She taught legal writing. Wonderful law professor. And at some point, she made the statement, and I've heard it from other people since, but she was the first one I ever heard it from, that the people who can't write clearly, the people who load their writing with academic jargon to make it inaccessible are the dumb people. I don't think she actually said they were the dumb people, but essentially said they're the people who don't know what they're talking about. And they're masking their their ignorance behind a lot of words. They're making their writing impenetrable. And, and it's not just them. Academics like to keep things in-house. So a lot of academics write things in ways that if you're not an academic, they become impenetrable. You've got to learn the language, and it's a different language from the English language you and I know. The really smart people in the world can take something complex and academic, and they can make it understandable to you. Now, I'm not that person, but I'm smart enough to steal from the smart people and tell you what they tell me. And in this case, Tim Keller. So what is postmodernism? It's at play in the world today. 
to understand postmodernism, you have to understand what modernity meant. Now, modernity took on a meaning, a philosophical meaning in, in universities and among historians and philosophers for what did modernity believe? Modernity believed there was absolute truth. That it may be complex, it may be hard to discern, but if you put enough time and effort into it, you can figure out what the actual truth is. Modernity believed that there could be objectivity, that everyone has a bias. Going into it, everybody has a bias. But that if you understood your bias and you understood there were other viewpoints and you worked very hard to understand the other side and grapple with the idea that there really is a truth that you could overcome your bias, even having it, and you could be objective. You could say this thing is so whether I agree or not. And it may disagree with your biases, but you could get it. Modernity believed in reason so that you and I, though we may be very emotional about things, we could take a truth and use objectivity and reason and separate our emotional impulses to arrive at that thing that is actually true. And above all else, Modernity believed that you and I coming from different worldviews with presuppositions could, in weighing the evidence based on objectivity and reason, arrive at the same point. Because if you and I, though we see the world in different ways, could all take the same elements of truth and put them together, it would lead us to a, an outcome that both of us could arrive at. That's modernity. Postmodernity is the exact opposite of all of those things. Where modernity uses reason, postmodernity uses emotion. Where modernity believes there is absolute truth, Postmodernism believes there's relative truth. Where modernism or modernity believes in objectivity, postmodernism believes there is nothing but subjectivity. And then where they really, really, really separate themselves among all these other separations is that in modernity, there is a belief that exceptions to the rule do not make the rule invalid. And in postmodernity, they believe that exceptions to a rule create a new rule, and those things that applied under the old rule become the exception. So how does that look? Well, I want you, if you can, if there are no clouds in the sky, to look out the window. If you've got a window, if you're in a car, you're in your home, you're in your office, and you look out the window and it's daytime and there are no clouds, what color is the sky? Modernity would say the sky is blue because 95% to 99% of the people who look at the sky without clouds in the middle of the day and there's no eclipse, you're going to show, you're going to see a blue sky. However, there are some people who are colorblind and they can't see the sky as blue. Therefore, modernity would say the sky is blue, but there are exceptions to the rule. For people with color blindness, there's a solar eclipse, so it's dark. There are clouds, things like that. What postmodernity would say is because exceptions, because exceptions exist, there is no rule. So the rule becomes that you cannot say the sky is blue because there are people who cannot see it as blue. You understand that? You got that? That's what's going on. That's what matters. That's the setup. Now, if that boggles your mind a little bit, it should because it all sounds kind of crazy. So where does postmodernity come from? Postmodernity comes from, of course, French philosophers. 
And the chief French philosopher, I cannot remember now, oh, what was the guy's name? Starts with a D. Um, but he was a pedophile. So you can see where all of this comes from. You have a French philosopher who is a pedophile who wants the exceptions to become the rule. He likes boys. So one should not objectively say it's bad because he doesn't believe it's bad. Therefore, we should all go through subjectivity. And the moral absolute truth is that pedophilia is bad, but this guy's a pedophile and he doesn't view himself as bad. Therefore, we can no longer use objectivity, nor can we use absolute truth, but must have relative truth. And his truth for him is that he loves boys. Yes, the dude was a pedophile. The The, the chief theorist for post-modernity was a pedophile who essentially was trying to get rid of the stigma of pedophilia, and he came up with postmodernism. and he was a Marxist philosopher, and the Marxists embraced it, and the universities and colleges embraced it and started teaching it that there is no absolute truth. There is no moral right and wrong. It's all subjective. There is no objectivity. There are no hard and fast rules. Everything is an exception, and because there's an exception— There are no rules. There is no right and wrong. And so how should we see the world instead in terms of power dynamics? Because if there's no right and there's no wrong and there's no truth and there's no lie and there's no rule and there's no exception, the only way to grapple with the world is through who has power and who doesn't. Thus, we arrive at the intersectionality of the modern left. The people who have been in charge are the powerful and the oppressor. The people who have not been in charge were the powerless and the oppressed. And we should listen to the powerless and the oppressed, not the powerful oppressor. Now, what happens when the powerless oppressed get in charge? What happens is that they don't admit that they're in charge because there's no absolute truth. You can't go out and say certain things against the alphabet gang or you're going to get canceled because they have the power. Now, here's what's so funny about this is you remember the quote of, you know who's in charge by who you can't criticize, and that's been tied to Voltaire. Well, the quote was actually made famous by a white supremacist. So according to the left, if you use this quote, you're quoting a white supremacist, except the white supremacist got it from a French philosopher Uh, It was also attributed to Voltaire, and I forget exactly who it was, but it was like an 18th century French philosopher, but it was actually used so much by white nationalists that now it's the white nationalist phrase, even though it's not. It's actually a pretty accurate snapshot of you know who's in charge by who you can't criticize, and you can't criticize so much of the trans community, the alphabet gang. You can't criticize Democrats. You can't criticize non-white people because you get censored. You you get canceled. Uh, You go after the poor Hamas protesters these days, and they accuse you of being anti-Palestinian. They turn everything on its head. And what they don't want, and this is how they play Calvin Ball, with postmodernism is the rules don't apply to them. They create the rules. So call it the, 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 the powerful oppressing the powerless are bad. But a Palestinian activist kills a Jewish man in Los Angeles, well, that's not really murder. It might have been an accident because the Palestinian is more oppressed than the Jew. Therefore, it can't really be considered bad. There's a video circulating online right now of a um, black criminal who used a backhoe to scoop a tear down the wall of a gas station and scoop out an ATM, tied a rope to it, dragged it off with his truck. It's remarkable. I mean, it's pretty brazen. Well, except, I mean, the police in these progressive areas like Los Angeles no longer view it as a crime because crime is now against people and crimes against property have insurance. Therefore, it's a victimless crime. Therefore, it is no crime. That's postmodernism. It's playing itself out all over our society. Postmodernism breaks down society. I believe in truth. Truth is incompatible with postmodernism. The solution is not to play the postmodernist game. It's to fight back with absolute truth because most people in their heart of hearts, in the core of their being, understand there are things that are true and good and things that are bad and wrong. And there are things that are morally right and things that are morally wrong. And you have to pursue people with truth, lovingly, not hostily 
to change their hearts and minds to get through this period of progressivism. But you need to understand that that is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a philosophy embraced by the academy that is derived from a pedophile who is trying to justify his pedophilia. At the heart of postmodernism is a justification for evil, and we're seeing this around the country and around the world, particularly as people can't bring themselves to criticize what Hamas did on October 7th and can't bring themselves to criticize a transgender shooter at Covenant School in Nashville and can't bring themselves to criticize violent young black men who are committing crimes in this country because of systemic oppression in this country. This is postmodernism. It is a philosophy based on deviancy, based on evil, and it's been embraced by so much of the academic community and by so many kids in this country now. It's polluted and rotted brains. At least understand what you're dealing with, and the way to fight back in all cases is absolute truth. Now, one of the absolute truths out there is that this economy continues to wobble. Another bank is failed, a farmer's bank in Iowa. Multiple banks continue to fail, and the government keeps bailing them out. These banks keep making profits, and they get sold to bigger banks that become too big to fail. Swiss America has been sounding the alarm about all of this with their secret war on cash, a report on the all-out assault on our freedoms. Interest rates soaring, squeezing the economy, banks teetering on collapse. Swiss America can educate you on ways to help protect your hard-earned assets now. Go read their report, The Secret War on Cash. Your copy is free by calling or texting 800-289-2646. The all-out war on cash includes digital forms of currency. It's spreading daily. You can read The Secret War on Cash. It's free to you guys. Mention my name, Eric Erickson, when you call or text 800-289-2646. 800-289-2646. You can also go to SwissAmerica.com slash Eric. That's SwissAmerica.com slash E-R-I-C-K. Or call or text my name to 800 289 2646. Message and data rates apply. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Welcome back. Eric Erickson here. The phone number 877-973-7425. Should you wish to be on the program? We'd love to have you on the program. There's a lot to, uh, a lot, lot to talk about. Um, Also, I do want to ask you again, with a lot of families struggling for this holiday season, um, if you would consider texting the word donate to 33777, I'm going to send you back a link. EricThanksgiving.com is the website. I'm partnering with Hungry for a Day around the country to help feed families at Thanksgiving, those in serious need who otherwise wouldn't have a Thanksgiving meal. Um, Every $40 feeds a family of four, and I'm talking turkey with the sides. You got all the trimmings. So you're going to get sweet potatoes. You're going to get the mac and cheese. You're going to get the bread. You're going to get a real Thanksgiving dinner. Um, People who are in need, and there are a lot more people this year than even last year, and there were a lot of people last year, so more this year. If you text DONATE to 33777, Every penny helps. $40 will feed a family of four, but if two people give 20, then suddenly together you fed a family of four. Um, And it it really, I appreciate it. It's tax tax deductible with Hungry for a Day. It's text DONATE to 33777. I'll send you the link. Just fill out the form. With Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, We've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. <laughs> 